This program is brought to you by Emory University. Hi, good morning, everyone. It is my pleasure to invite back Dr. Lucia Alvarez today. Dr. Alvarez went to medical school in Spain and did her internal medicine training at Wake Forest, did her cardiology fellowship here at Emory, and for those of you who don't know, she stayed on and did structural um, imaging fellowship here with us. And I'm glad that she didn't cancel her travel this morning from St. Joe's because of the coronavirus uh, travel ban. And um, we're going to hear today about tricuspid valve, no longer the forgotten valve. Lucia? Good morning. Thank you so much for the invitation. Thank you so much for, for being here with me today. Well, let's talk about this valve. A uh, very interesting topic. In fact, um, I don't have no disclosures. And then, what I'm trying to achieve today? Well, let's review what we know and what we learned recently about tricuspid valve. Uh, how often is it? Tricuspid regurgitation is going to be our focus. What's the prognosis of my patient with bad TR? And then, is all TR the same? No. So we will talk about the classification of the different etiologies and physiopathologies of tricuspid regurgitation. How do we diagnose it and assess severity? And then the last, what do I do with my patient? What options do I have? So why is tricuspid regurgitation important? Well, it's important because it's very common. So um, up to 1.6 million Americans have significant tricuspid regurgitation. And it's a difficult disease to assess because usually uh, happens in the setting of other cardiovascular diseases like left side heart failure, valvular disease, so it's a very heterogeneous disease, difficult to characterize like a unique entity. Has a poor prognosis, and we will talk about that. Uh, even in different clinical scenarios, having severe TR implies poor prognosis. And then, what do we about, about management? We do medical management most of the time, and there is no good response to medical management. It doesn't change the prognosis of the disease. And what about surgery? We know that surgery is rarely performed and the mortality is very high. So that leads us with a bad disease, poor prognosis, frequent, that we have been ignoring for a long time, living untreated. And this is in part because of our lack of understanding of the disease and lack of knowledge about how to appropriately diagnose. So that gave the name of the tricuspid valve, the forgotten valve which has been long term in law. But this is not true anymore. It's not a forgotten valve. And as you can see, you do a search in PubMed, you can see how there's a significant growing interest in publications, especially in the last 10 years. So being up to four times what it was like 15 years ago. So why is so important? This is one of the principal papers published regarding prognosis of tricuspid regurgitation, which is cited in most of the papers about tricuspid regurgitation. And it looked at the prognosis of um, tricuspid regurgitation. So that's a study done in, at the VA, and it looked at a series of over 5,000 patients uh, by ECHO, and it looked at the div different degrees of tricuspid regurgitation and followed the patients for um, um, an average of uh, four years. And it looked that, uh, it found that with increasing severity of tricuspid regurgitation, there is increased mortality, being with a hazard ratio of 1.3 for the cases with severe uh, TR when compared with no TR or trace TR. And that association with increased mortality remained even when adjusted for left ventricular heart failure and pulmonary pressure. So you can see how the significant TR has a bad impact on survival. But we know that tricuspid regurgitation usually it doesn't, it's not an isolated disease, so it happens in the setting of other cardiovascular diseases, pulmonary hypertension, low EF. So maybe the effect is just masked or is affected by the other associated diseases. So this study, published in 2019, 
looked, uh, there's a meta-analysis of studies that um, evaluated prognosis of trichospiratory regurgitation, and it found the same, the worse the TRS, the worse the mortality, and also when you adjust for all, the, all these other um, factors, like right ventricular dysfunction, pulmonary hypertension, atrial fibrillation, significant mitral regurgitation, or low EF, that association remained significant. So trichospiratory regurgitation is not an innocent bystander of these more commonly recognized conditions. So what happened in the community? Uh, what happened with all these patients who have severe trichospiratory regurgitation? <coughs> Excuse me. This is a very interesting study uh, published uh, last year. And what it did, it looked at the series of echoes in the Olmsted County Mayo Clinic done between 1990 and 2000. So 10 years of echoes done with a clinical reason. And it looked at the, it classified the echoes with different degrees of uh, trichospiratory regurgitation. And it found that over a thousand of patients had more than moderate trichospiratory regurgitation. And then it tried to assess what's the frequency of significant TR in the community. And he found that trichospiratory regurgitation significant, severe, moderate or severe, is frequent, estimated with a prevalence of 0.55%. And when you look at and compare with the prevalence of the other valvular disease, it's almost a quarter of the prevalence of the other valvular disease, similar to the prevalence of aortic stenosis. So significant trichospiratory regurgitation is frequent in the community. And then when you look at the survival, what happened with these patients, um, when you look at the, all the types of trichospiratory regurgitation, you see that uh, mortality <coughs> is high at 5, 10, and 15 years with a very low rate of survival down to 10% at 15 years, so pretty low. But you may think, well, we talk about significant TR being associated to other conditions that can increase mortality, like left side disease or valvular disease. But what happened if we looked at only isolated trichospiratory regurgitation when we don't have the other um, cardiac problems? Still, mortality remains very high, with a mortality up to 26% at five, uh, 15 years. So mortality is high even with isolated trichospiratory regurgitation. And then they look at management of these patients, and what they found that most of the patients were clinically managed, 98%, and only a low percentage, 2.4%, underwent surgery. And then not all TR is the same, so there is TR associated with different conditions, but mortality remains high in all the subgroups, especially in the group of left ventricular dysfunction or valvular dysfunction. Also, significant TR is associated with increase of heart failure and atrial fibrillation. So I think this study is very revealing about what's the situation right now. It's frequent, it has poor prognosis, and it's under-treated. So why is that? We haven't paid attention to the trichospirate valve in many years. That was in partly uh, caused because we thought that it was a secondary disease caused by problems on the left side, expected to improve once we took care of the problems on the left side. And now, lately, it has been recognized that this is not true. The prognosis is not as good as we thought. And then the emerging uh, new transcatheter uh, options for treatment are also focusing uh, the importance of taking care of the trichospiratory regurgitation. So why we was in part being ignored and treated med medically? So that comes from a study from a long time ago, 1967, published by uh, Nina Brangwell, where they look at some patients, few numbers, less than 30 patients, who underwent uh, surgery for mitral valve disease, rheumatic, either stenosis or regurgitation. They assess the patients and um, they uh, selected patients with severe TR based on clinical exam. At that time, JVD, murmur, ascites, hepatomegaly. And then they follow the patients after surgery with medical management, which at that time was low salt, diuretics, digoxin. And then they found that in follow-up, patients did well. So many of the patients were able to 
have improvement of the symptoms and go back to regular low salt diet. So it was thought that treating left side problems will decrease the burden on the right and decrease the tracheospiratal regurgitation. But studies years later showed that this is not always true. So a few years later, published studies with patients with mitral stenosis who underwent um, percutaneous valvuloplasty showed that um, moderate severe tracheospiratal regurgitation after successful treatment of the mitral stenosis did not improve tracheospiratal regurgitation in follow-up. Even more, um, some patients who had successful mitral valve replacement over time showed new diagnosis of severe isolated tracheospiratal regurgitation despite of normal function of the mitral valve prosthetic valve. So we know tracheospiratal regurgitation is a progressive disease. It not always gets better after treating the left side problem, and it can also appear de novo years later treating the left side uh, valvular problem. Many studies has been published, have been published regarding this issue, reporting uh, incidence of late uh, tricuspid regurgitation ranging from 16 to up to 67% after mitral surgery. And this huge range depends on the way they assess the tricuspid regurgitation, the study population, and also it's very important what's the time frame for um, this TR2 appear. So, this study showed how uh, tricuspid regurgitation can be a late finding after mitral valve surgery. So it studied 600 patients who went surgery from left side and followed the patients during a period of 11 years and found that 27 patients had the novo late TR. And um, these patients who had new uh, significant TR so almost a quarter, uh, a little bit more than a quarter of the patients had also worse prognosis. Again, TR, significant TR has poor prognosis. And then um, they look at what factors could be associated with this late appearance of tracheospiratal regurgitation and found that atrial fibrillation is an independent uh, factor for development of um, late TR. And this is important because we will talk later about the role of atrial fibrillation in the setting of tricuspid regurgitation. Well, let's talk about different types of tricuspid regurgitation. It's a very heterogeneous disease and different physiopathologies, different management, different diagnosis. So we have two big groups, primary and secondary. Primary refers to regurgitation caused by problems in the leaflets, which could be either congenital, being the typical example, Epstein, or it can be acquired because of inflammation, fibrosis, or damage to the valve, like it happens in endocarditis, carcinoid, in trauma because of chest trauma, or in the myocardial biopsy, or um, lately, increasing rate of um, damage to the valves because of the pacemaker or ICD leads. But let's move to the other group which is the most commonly encountered in clinical practice, which is the secondary tracheospiratal regurgitation. So in this group, the leaflets work fine. There's a problem of the function of the complex of the tracheospiratal valve involving the, left, the right atrium and the right ventricle. And this is because of problems with the left side disease, either valvular or cardiomyopathy. It can be a problem on the right ventricle. Uh, because of primary pressure overload in settings of uh, chronic uh, lung problems, or it can be any cause of right ventricular dysfunction, like it happens in uh, RV ischemia or infarct and, um, in ARVD. So in order to understand the different types of tricuspid regurgitation, let's review quickly, briefly, what's the anatomy of the tricuspid valve. Tricuspid valve is... Um, is not only the leaflets, it's a complex, which includes the anulus, leaflets, papillary muscles, and the cords, and uh, is the most apical uh, position valve, it's anterior, and it's the largest valve of the four we have. And one of the important characteristics of tricuspid valve is there is a significant rate of variability in the anatomy. All the components have to work together in order to ensure normal function of the valve. 
So leaflets, tricuspid typically has three leaflets, but it's not always true. Has been shown that there's a significant variability, reported number of valves for the leaflets from two to up to six, and even more in some studies. Um, the leaflets are not equal in shape or size. The longest is the anterior leaflet, the most mobile. The septal is the smallest one, it's more fixed, it has a semilunar <coughs> appearance. And the posterior leaflet is, is the one that has less circumferential ratio and has um, scallops and that's attached to the posterior um, wall of the right ventricular. And then the leaflets are thin and very translucent, uh, fragile, different than mitral. And that's relevant because they are more difficult to image. And also when we talk about percutaneous interventions, they can be harder to, to, to grasp or to manage. And then coaptation point. So in order to ensure lack of regurgitation, there should be a coaptation body to body of the leaflets with a length of at least five to 10 millimeters. That has been called as the coaptation reserve, and that ensures that when the annulus dilates, there's still enough leaflet to maintain the coaptation. So it can um, still having coaptation edge to edge and preserve the function of the valve. As you can see here, um, there is overlap, I mean, some uh, zone lifted leaflet to leaflet to ensure this uh, coaptation reserve. And then when you lose that, you can see the gap in the coaptation of the leaflets. Annulus, important, important uh, structure, very important in the physiopathology of the tricuspid regurgitation. As in the mitral, it's like a solid shape the structure, it's oval, and then it's dynamic. So the mitral has a very well-defined fibrous annulus, which is not the case in the tricuspid annulus. Sometimes it's just part of the right atrium, and right ventricle tissue, so not always very well-defined. And then um, the area is the largest valve, so the area is up to 11 uh, centimeters square, and it's dynamic. So it just changes shape with contraction, and then it moves also towards the up end with contraction to ensure good coaptation of the leaflets. And then the papillary muscles and cords, we have three papillary muscles, and each of them giving cords to two different um, um, leaflets. Anterior is the largest one to the anterior and posterior leaflet, the posterior to the posterior and the septal. And then septal papillary muscle is variable. It may be absent. And then what is very characteristic about the tricuspid valve is that the septal leaflet may have cords itself going directly to the septum. And this is relevant because of, it can explain part of the physiopathology when there is displacement of the septum, it can tether the septal leaflet and can be a cause for regurgitation. So let's talk, I will focus on the secondary and functional tricuspid regurgitation because this is what we encounter in clinic. Up to 80, some studies report 90% of the cases um, we see of tricuspid regurgitation are secondary. And then briefly, we'll talk about this small entity called isolated tricuspid regurgitation, where you see severe, you see TR, not in the setting of left side heart disease or pulmonary hypertension. So it's a different entity with different characteristics. And then how do we get secondary tricuspid regurgitation? Well, the final mechanistic ways are either tricuspid annular dilatation, which can happen because of atrial fibrillation or increased left side pressure because of left side, left side heart disease, either CAD or left ventricular dysfunction or mitral valve disease. And that will result in enlarged atrium and then tricuspid annular dilatation, or it can happen because of tricuspid lifted thethering, thethering, because there is pulmonary hypertension, either consequence of retrograde increase of the pressures from the left side or primary increased pressures from pulmonary disease. So these two mechanisms can lead to functional tricuspid regurgitation. So let's look at these patients. 
There is no color, but you can see there is coaptation problems in both of them. But they are two different entities. Not only that one is transthoracic, there's DE, but you can see the leafless itself are structurally normal, but they don't coapt. And there's very different way of coaptation on the left, which coaps more like this, than in the left, in the right, that coaps more flat. So let's look at the two mechanisms and what we find when we see the, how the, the heart looks. We have the mechanism of tricuspid dilatation, where we see that there's a large annulus. The leaflets don't reach to coapt in the middle. And then when we look at the right ventricle, the right ventricle has the conical shape, normal shape, but there is enlargement of the base of the, um, the right ventricle. This is what we see in idiopathic tricuspid regurgitation. There is no much tenting. The opposite will be the other um, picture. Well, we see that the annulus is not so much enlarged, but the leaflets are tenting. So they are just uh, co-opting below the level of the annulus. And then the right ventricle doesn't have a normal morphology. It has an elliptical spherical shape, and that's causing tenting, tethering of the leaflets from the papillary muscles because of different architecture of the right ventricle. And that's what we see in functional TR associated with pulmonary hypertension. So focus on two mechanisms. One is the annulus. We talk about how the normal annulus looks. So it's oval shape and it's shadow, shadow shape. What happens when you get annular dilatation? Well, the septum is fixed, so cannot dilate in, uh, in the area of the septum. So it dilates mainly in the posterior lateral area. And there's not only dilatation. The tricuspid annulus loses his shape, uh, shadow shape, and it becomes flattened. So that decreases the capacity of coaptation of the, le uh, the leaflets in the middle. So you can see in these two pictures how different the tricuspid annulus looks when there is annular dilatation. But when we look at the annular dilatation, how much dilatation is enough to cause TR? Well, there was a um, experimental study done in Georgia Tech with uh, porcine models of heart, and they found that only 40% of tricuspid annular dilatation, compared to 75% of dilatation in the mitral, is enough to cause significant tricuspid refugitation. The displacement, as we talk, is mainly in the posterior lateral, also anterior uh, area of the annulus. So there is a gap that happens, usually in the middle, but affecting mainly to the anterior leaflet. And the minimal coaptation length that we need to prevent uh, uh, regurgitation is five millimeters. So this is the mechanism of the tricuspid annular dilatation. Let's talk about the other one, tethering. So we know this is a very important mechanism in um, causing tricuspid regurgitation, especially in patients with pulmonary hypertension, where there is a change in the geometry of the right ventricle. So the papillary muscles kind of pull the leaflets, and then um, that causes problems with coaptation. The septal leaflet is the most commonly affected. And then uh, when we look at how much tethering is associated to significant tricuspid regurgitation, well, a tethering distance, so between the annulus to the coaptation of more than eight millimeters or an area of more than 1.6 millimeters centimeter square has been associated with severe functional tricuspid regurgitation. That can be evaluated either by 2D or by 3D with the benefit of 3D of looking at volume and also evaluating the tethering when it's not symmetric. So if it is asymmetric, you can find the, long, the longest distance, the largest area. And why is this is important? It's not important only because it's associated to significant tricuspid regurgitation. It's also important because it can affect the selection of how I repair my patients if they go for surgery. Because remember, when we do surgery, most of the cases, the treatment is annular, annuloplasty, and that's addressing problem with annular dilatation. But if the patient has significant tethering, that's not going to be taking care with the annuloplasty. So it has been shown that amount of tethering is one of the prognostic factors that predicts failure of um, <laughs> tricuspid valve surgery. So if the surgeon sees that there is significant tethering, may consider other techniques like 
leaflet augmentation, or if there's significant degree of tethering, it may even need replacement of the valve. So we talk about the septal tethering. I think this is a nice example. You can see this is a case of severe primary pulmonary hypertension, where you see really enlarged right ventricle. This is a young patient, and you can see the cordal attachment of the septal leaflet directly to the septum, and how this premium of the septum, in this case from the right to the left, is just uh, tethering the leaflet and then causing the tenting. You can see the coaptation below the annulus, and as a consequence, severe tachospect regurgitation. You can see in this case, there's also significant right atrium dilatation and um, annular dilation, because these two mechanisms at the end end up being combined because severe tachospectral regurgitation begets more TR, so ends up causing as, uh, combined um, mechanisms in the late uh, patients, in the late uh, tachospectral regurgitation patients. So that brings up a new concept about ventricular tachospectral regurgitation and atrial tachospectral regurgitation, which was pretty new to me. So not all TR is the same. We have been talking about this. Two different mechanisms and probably maybe two different managements. So um, two different evaluations by ECHO, similar annulus, largest annulus area in the atrial with a smaller tendon volume, flat annulus, flat coaptation versus a smaller annulus with more tendon. And um, was this new entity of atrial, fibrilla atrial TR? Well, that's something we see in atrial fibrillation. That's where we, I presented isolated tracheospatial regurgitation. We found patients with no left side valvular disease, no pulmonary hypertension, no left side cardiomyopathy with severe TR. And then um, why does it happen? Well, that, that was addressed in a very interesting study uh, published a few years ago, where they look at this group of patients with uh, atrial fibrillation and significant TR with 3DT, and they compare the patients with normal controls and also with patients with left side heart disease. And they found that clinical um, features that were associated to this group of patients were advanced age, so an average age of 79, females, systemic hypertension, greater right than left side enlargement, and also they have lower pulmonary pressure when compared to the group of patients with left side disease. And then um, the prevalence of this, it was low. It was only 9%, which is similar to what they have found in other studies, compared to 45% of prevalence of atrial fibrillation in patients with left side heart disease. And then when um, they looked, they compared with the normal controls, they found, with, we have already presented, that these patients have a larger annulus, it was dysfunctional with less tethering, and compared to the patients with a normal sinus rhythm and left heart disease. And when you compare both groups, atrial fibrillation, left heart side disease, with normal controls, you find that the annular area is related to tracheospectral regurgitation in both, but in the group of atrial fibrillation, the annular area, it was strongly correlated with the right atrium volume, whereas in the right vent, in the in the left side disease, um, atrial um, tracheospectral regurgitation, the annular area was associated with right ventricular volume. So tracheospectral orientation, AFib with right atrium, in left heart disease with the right ventricle. So that leads me to right right atrium, another forgotten structure. When we look at tricuspectral regurgitation, we focus on the right ventricle and we forget the right atrium. So right atrium and right left ventricle has been uh, found to be very early sensitive indicators of tricuspectral regurgitation. Now we know that right atrial enlargement occurs before right ventricular dilatation, which happens later in the progression of the disease of severe tricuspectral regurgitation. And then studies in these patients with no left heart side disease or pulmonary hypertension show that there is a very close correlation between enlargement of the annulus and then right atrial volume. And then, um, as we know, the larger the annulus is, more TR severity. 
Despite of this evidence, we have been ignoring the role of the right atrium, the right atrium uh, in this physiopathology of the tricuspid regurgitation. So don't forget the other forgotten structure of the heart, which has been the right atrium. So that brings the question. So I know that patients with atrial fibrillation may have tricuspid anulus dilatation and may have severe TR. So what if we do something about the atrial fibrillation? Could it prevent late TR? Well, that was addressed in this study where patients undergoing uh, mitral valve surgery had maze to prevent uh, atrial fibrillation. And they compare what happened with the tricuspid regurgitation rate in patients with maze versus no maze and patients who remain in sinus rhythm. And they found that uh, if it predisposes to progression of TR, you have surgery, mitral valve surgery, and that that can be prevented by maze. And this is mainly in part uh, because you can restore and maintain the atrial function. So that supports all the concept of the atrial annulus and atrial fibrillation as a cause of um, significant TR. How do we evaluate the annulus? Well, per guidelines, they recommend evaluation with 2D. And then numbers important to remember are a cutoff of 40 millimeters or 21 millimeters square as the cutoff for addressing uh, tricuspid regurgitation, uh, uh, addressing tricuspid valve disease and tricuspid valve replacement or repair in patients undergoing four other type of cardiac surgery. But 2D has some limitations when we evaluate the tricuspid annulus. So they recommend for chamber view, you look at the mid septal to meet either anterior or posterior of the annulus. But we know that there are no very ana clear anatomic landmarks. So this fourth chamber can leave different measurements depending on the angulation. It has to be measured in diastole. But tricuspid annulus is dynamic. So it varies even within the diastolic uh, period. And then recommendation is with 2D. But we know that this is a very complex 3D structure. And a linear dimension may not reflect the real dimension of the 3D structure. And we know that this is poorly reproducible. So studies from RB, recommendations for RB, we know different angulations can lead to different measurements. So no reproducible measurements. What's the solution for the, this? We can do 3D echo, and then we can get an anatomically oriented tricuspid annulus measurement. And this is independent of assumptions about the shape and orientation. And um, doing that, we found that the measurements we obtained by 2D are always underestimating the real annulus dimension. The problem with this is there's no commercially available package software dedicated for measurement of this. So what we are not maybe doing is just doing from 3D multiplane reconstructions with are not giving us the exact number of measurement that we need. The other challenge is that tricuspid annulus is dynamic. So it changes over the cycle. It's um, minimum in mid-late systole. The maximum size area happens at the end of uh, diastole after the atrial contraction, where the anterior-posterior dimension is longer than the septal lateral oval shape. Also, uh, it goes from more circular during systole to more elliptical during diastole. So there is a change of the annulus area up to 35% during the cardio cycle. So that makes it challenging when would you try to evaluate. Uh, here they presented the normal studies, the normal values found in a study by uh, 3D echo. Uh, normal area in healthy um, subjects was like 8.6 centimeters square with a minimal dimension of 36, sorry, a maximal dimension of 36, a minimal dimension of 30. And then the other uh, thing that can help is 3D printing, where you can uh, see how it looks in 3D, and that helps for teaching and also for planning procedures. And you can see how different pathologies have different appearance of the annulus, dilatation, and also tendon that can be measured. Well, we talk about the atrial fibrillation. Let's talk about ventricular fibrillation. <coughs> <coughs> so one important group is what happens with my patients with, with low ejection fraction. This has been broadly studied with mitral regurgitation. So what happens with uh, tricuspid regurgitation? 
there's a study um, uh, uh, published by Mayo Clinic where it looked at all the echoes done from 2003 to 2011 of patients diagnosed with heart failure with redu reduced ejection fraction. They exclude patients with valvular disease, it's therefore mitral regurgitation, patients with um, pacemaker or ICD leads. And then they found that 88% um, of the patients had functional TR. So as we know, it's a frequent disease. And then uh, up to 6% had severe tachyspersic regurgitation. The mean uh, ejection fraction was 36. The pulmonary pressure was around 40. 20% uh, of them had uh, atrial fibrillation. And then um, what they found is that functional TR is independently associated with elevated systolic pressure, systolic uh, pulmonary pressure, older age, female, lower ejection fraction, mitral regurgitation, and atrial fibrillation. And then they also found that functional TR was associated with being sicker. So patients had more dyspnea, more worse kidney function, or lower cardiac output. So we know what population had more incidence of the trachospera regurgitation functional, older people, female with low EF, and um, atrial fibrillation, and also these people were also sicker, more heart failure, worse than kidney function. And then when you look at the prognosis and survival of these groups, you can see a clear difference between the degrees of trachospectral regurgitation with different mortality um, at first year, and uh, five years, and at 10 years with significant difference uh, between severe TR versus the other degrees of TR. That was maintained over time. And then the Hertzsch ratio of mortality with um, severe TR was found up to 2.67. So significant impact in this group of patients on low EF of having a severe trichospect regurgitation. Although even having, having mild has an impact on mortality. And then, well, you can say, is that because of RV dysfunction or is that because of pulmonary hypertension? What happens in these patients? So is the tracheospit regurgitation itself the cause of the problem or is because this, this is the consequence of the other underlying problem. Well, this effect of mortality was maintained even when correcting for right ventricular dysfunction. You can see differences in all degrees of severity of TR and also with pulmonary hypertension. Although the association of higher um, functional TR grade with mortality was more attenuated in patients with pulmonary hypertension. So now we know in this group of patients of low EF, with heart failure, TR, the more severe, the more mortality. And this is independent of right ventricular uh, failure, and that's independent of pulmonary hypertension. So despite of this, the study showed that very few patients underwent surgery. So that brings up the question, is like, is there a potential therapeutic target for trachospert recruitation in this significant population, and then should we include the tricuspid regurgitation in the score of severity of patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction? And then that brings the question about maybe there is a role for percutaneous therapies. And this group of patients, as we do with MR, may benefit from treatment of functional TR. <laughs> so we talk about how different degrees of TR impact different mortality, right? So quantification matters. And when we do quantification of these patients, study published last year, patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, where they did quantification, they found difference in survival based on vena, vena contractor measurements with a cutoff of five, based on ERO with a cutoff of 0.2, which is lower than we have as a criteria for severe, and the same with regurgitant volume, 20 millimeters. So quantification is important because can also stratify patients in terms of prognosis. How do we do quantification? Where our main, um, our main um, tool to do that is ECHO. But ECHO is challenging. It's challenging because what we do for TR, tracospit is what we have learned from mitral, but there are two different valves. 
different anatomy, different hemodynamics, different geometry of the RFS. So the methods that we learn from mitral haven't been validated for tricuspid. Also, tricuspid regurgitation is very variable, and it depends on loading conditions. And it also can vary a lot depending on respiration. We talk about right atrium and also right ventricle. Right ventricle can be very challenging to evaluate by echo. And then at the end, all this requires expertise. So despite of the guidelines saying how important is a multi-parametric, semi-quantitative, and quantitative approach, what we see in daily practice is that most of the quantification is just um, qualitative parameters, mainly based on color Doppler, and that leads to a significant rate of underdiagnosis of the disease. So what do we use for quantification? And what's the limitations we know that are for tricuspid regurgitation? We use PISA, easy, quick to do, and reproducible. But tricuspid is different. So the shape of the hemisphere is not a hemisphere, it's more hemi-elliptical. And then um, lower pressures on the right side lead to underestimation. We see that underestimation by PISA can be up to 40 or 50% of the ERO when you do use quantitative uh, measurements by Doppler. And um, if we have a lead, pacemaker ICD lead, that can also lead to underestimating. So no much experience about uh, quantification with TR with PISA. Vena contracta, narrowest dimension of the jet by color Doppler. Well, in tricuspid, my vena contracta is not a circular. It's usually a regular shaped area. So depending on how do I measure, I can get significant variability. So if I just measure from anterior to posterior, you get a very long dimension, but if you measure septal to lateral, different levels, you can get a very small dimension. So the minimal width of the vena contracta can be up to 40 or 60% smaller than the longest one. So that's another limitation. How can we overcome this by 3D? By 3D, where you can get these different orthogonal uh, planes, and you can get the area of the vena contracta, and you can measure it. Uh, there is no published uh, validated cutoff for what's the area for diagnosis of severe TR, although some studies have showed that an area more than 75 millimeters squares has been associated with severe tricuspid regurgitation. And then, lastly, severity is variable, and we see this every day in clinical practice. Um, it depends on respiratory variation. So during inspiration, there is increase of vein return on the left, on the right side that increases the size of the annulus and increases the regurgitant RFS up to almost 70%. That, will, that leads to an increase of up to 20% of the regurgitant volume during inspiration. So where do we measure? We measure in inspiration, we measure in expiration, we measure holding, breathing, or we just average. We don't know. And loading conditions, we see this. So patients who had, had diuresis have a significant improvement, a decrease of the TR severity, the opposite when patients re, um, receive fluids. And then we are talking about evaluation of uh, tricuspid by echo. We cannot forget that the main tool for tricuspid is 3D echocardiography. Very important, uh, it will let us see the three leaflets and evaluate what's the physiopathology of the problem and the mechanisms of tricuspid regurgitation. It will help us to adequately measure the annulus size and the tentin volume. Can help us to quantification with the 3D vena contracta. And very important in the group of patients that we see more often and often, which is the, pace the patients with the pacemaker lead. So we quantify the tricuspid regurgitation. That's what the guidelines say, uh, go guidelines. So we know that more than this cutoff value is severe. We know that um, what happens beyond that? Because it is severe, and there is very, very, very severe. And there is no cutoffs beyond that. And we know that we don't have medical, much clinical experience in TR compared to mitral or aortic regurgitation. So knowing this problem, 
there has been a proposed uh, classification grading the more severe TR with criteria for massive and torrential TR. Why is this important? They saw that in studies going for percutaneous treatment, patients with very, very severe torrential TR, even though you reduce the TR from severe to severe, which is from torrential to less severe, patients had clinical improvement, but cannot be quantified. So that improvement in the degree of the TR, even within the degree of severe, was associated with uh, symptoms improvement and increase on forward drug volume. So it seems reasonable to think about that not all the severe TR is the same. Not all the severe TR has the same prognosis. But when we look at the echo, quantification is not enough. We should not forget looking at the mechanisms of tricuspid regurgitation, evaluate the annulus or the coaptation, and also the impact on the remodeling on the right ventricle. And here we can see how the uh, what we see in echo is different in the atrial versus the tricuspid. So we can see the morphology of the leaflets. We can see the tethering, the annulus size, the direction of the jet, which is more central in atrial functional, where there is a more dilatation and problem with central coaptation versus a more asymmetric, uh, eccentric um, TR in case of tethering. And then we should look at the ventricular size and function and the atrial size and function. And sometimes we need the help of additional uh, imaging techniques. Uh, echo is very important for first assessment and is very important for um, procedural management, but cardiac MR can help us with evaluation of the right ventricle function. And then CT has a very important role, especially in the field of interventional for planning, vascular access, and then evaluation of the structures are close to the tricuspid uh, valve that can be um, at risk, for example, the right uh, coronary artery. So don't forget about the other um, imaging technologies. What do the guidelines say? So we know this is, is a bad disease, it's frequent. Um, what guidance we get from the guidelines? We have the American guidelines and the European guidelines. So let's look at the American guidelines from 2014, because the update from 2017 didn't mention any updates about tricuspid. This is the table that they showed, but let's make it easy. So if we have functional tricuspid regurgitation and the patient is going for left side heart, uh, surgery, if it is severe tricuspid regurgitation, just fix the tricuspid. So you're going for surgery for the left, severe TR, fix it. If your TR is not severe, but you have annular dilatation, then, um, or you have pulmonary hypertension without annular dilatation, there is also a recommendation for tricuspid valve repair, either 2B or 2A um, recommendation. There is also recommendations about primary tricuspid regurgitation. So you have either severe primary, uh, severe primary tricuspid regurgitation that is symptomatic, or even though if it is asymptomatic, but there is signs of failing RV, there is recommendations for tricuspid valve repair or replacement. And then there is a third category, which is in patients for reoperation. So patients who had already um, surgery for, <coughs> for left side, where have um, worsening um, RV function or pulmonary hypertension that is not severe, and then there's recommendations for tricuspid valve uh, repair. But where's my patient with severe isolated secondary tricuspid regurgitation? There's no recommendations about that. Important, again, the annulus, just the fact that the patient doesn't have severe TR at the time of surgery doesn't mean that the patient is not at risk for developing that. And then we know that TR is preload dependent. So just finding an anatomic substrate like a annular dilatation is enough to uh, go and repair that. And the cutoffs that they showed is by 2D echo, 40 millimeters or 21 millimeters square by uh, 21 millimeters by meter square, or intra-op assessment with a diameter more than 70 millimeters. What about the European guidelines? Same, you are going for left side, you have either severe TR or another dilatation, 
just fix it. But you have severe TR, if you are symptomatic or a failing right ventricle, fix it. But if you have severe secondary TR, well, you have a bad right ventricle or bad LV function or severe pulmonary hypertension, no role for intervention, just conservative management. You are too sick. But if you don't have failing ventricle or severe pulmonary hypertension, if you are symptomatic, recommendation for repair. If you are not symptomatic, then they recommend um, um, following the um, RV progression function and then conservative management. Again, severe secondary tracheospiral regurgitation, we don't know what to do if I have right ventricular dysfunction, severe right left ventricular dysfunction or pulmonary hypertension. So what's the current status of surgery? We know, we look at the surgery, this um, published in 2013, look at the surgery for 10 years, very rarely there. Only uh, with a high mortality, 8%, and most of the surgeries are done at the time of the left side. Most of the surgeries were repaired, and predictors of mortality were comorbidities, COPD, renal failure, stroke, diabetes, CAD, older age, heart failure, or advanced heart failure, and then concomitant surgery could be either cavity or tri triple valve disease. What about isolated surgery? Just surgery for the tracheospit is even rather, uh, less frequent, and the mortality is still very high, up to 8%. Um, and even though the numbers of replacement and repair have been increasing over the years, the mortality remains high at 9%. And then mortality is higher in older patients with replacement and the patients who had in, uh, renal disease. So why mortality is so high for isolated tracheospit regurgitation compared to isolated valvular disease in the area of the mitral position, which is reported between two or 3%. So maybe it's because we are doing surgery too late. And when you look at the mortality of tricuspid valve disease, looking at the patients depending on the clinical situation, symptoms before the surgery, we see that patients who had um, um, New Year Association stage four have significant increased mortality with surgery. And if we reduce, uh, if we do surgeries with a lower NIHA association at, uh, before surgery, the mortality is reduced to 6%. So up to 18% when they are very, very symptomatic. And then if we operate them with uh, less symptoms, the mortality drops up to 6%. So what do we know? We know the only class one for treatment is surgery. We know that most of the cases are done during the left side surgery. We know that this very rarely there, high mortality. We know if we don't do it, severe TR will be get more TR dilatation and it will perpetuate the disease. And we know that medical treatment is not effective to stop the progression of the disease. What do we know? There is a lot more than we don't know. There is no significant studies to show evidence for the guidelines to support more recommendations that we will have. We don't know what's the threshold in the RV function, right? So we know in the mitral and the aortic, we have a combination of symptoms, function, the degree of the disease that guide us when to treat before the ventricle fails, that's not true for the right ventricle with the limitation of echo being sometimes not the best tool for assessment of the function. We don't know what to do with our patients with atrial fibrillation and TR. And then maybe too late referral for surgery when the patient is already with end stage renal um, organ disease, failed right ventricle, and there is no way in reverse the progression of the disease. We see this in patients who undergo um, percutaneous treatment for mitral of aortic, but TR also is a marker of increase as associated independently with increased mortality. What do we do with these patients? We are not sending them for surgery, but TR is still having prognostic effect in these patients despite of treatment of the left side problem. And um, maybe there is a role for percutaneous interventions. So, um, too late, too little, very infrequent. This, uh, the solution of this may be um, hard team decision making where you assess the risk of the patients and the options and then intervene before it's too late, before there is a um, point of no return of the RV problems. And um, that opens the field of the interventions, has been growing fast for the last 10 years with multiple techniques 
Let me show you. They replicate what we see in the surgical field, addressing either the annulus or coaptation of the leaflets, or even uh, new valves or palliative measurements, just trying to uh, prevent the backflow uh, from the right atrium to the K valve. And the results of the, these interventions have been published in the um, and evaluating this international trivalve registry, which is the largest series of patients with uh, transcatheter tricuspid interventions, and it includes in the last publication from last year, 312 patients with severe TR symptomatic treated with different devices. The most common ones were leaflet um, approximation with Matraclip or Pascal. And then patients were sick. Most of them were functional TR, and most of them were New York Association 3 and 4 and ejection fraction was only mildly reduced, and then the TR was very severe. Success of the procedure was significantly high, up to 70%, so it worked. And then what happens? So when you compare procedure success versus failure, patients who had success of the procedure, in all patients, uh, that includes patients who also had mitral intervention at the same time, patient survival is better, and also in patients who only have tricuspid uh, procedure. So it works, it was achievable, and patients did better. The, the symptoms improved um, if there was tricuspid regurgitation um, reduction, and there was significant reduction in the tricuspid regurgitation degree after the procedure. So there's new interventions we know that are feasible. There's still research, uh, a lot to learn. Selection is very important to know what's the right device for the right patient. The mortality is low compared to surgery, and we need to have um, more research and new devices that help us to achieve more success right, right, uh, rate, but that open us, opens the huge uh, field of the growing field of the transcutaneous um, uh, treatment for tricuspid valve. Thank you. Well, that, <clears throat> I'll start off. That, that was fantastic. I, I learned a lot. Um, just uh, the assessment of RV function seems to be sort of the critical um, lynch point, uh, or I guess the pivotal point in making that decision. And I mean, is you know, in, I guess in your, in your isolated tricuspid patients that aren't going to surgery for some other thing. Uh, could you talk a little more about that and sort of what you use as sort of your best way of assessing RV function? Because I guess uh, in my experience, that seems to be the most debatable component when we're talking about these patients. Well, there is no doubt that the best way of assessing right ventricular function is, uh, is MRI. So, but we, we have in daily clinic as a first tool is right ventricular. And I think sometimes we feel reassured thinking that we know what we're seeing, but that's not true. There's a lot of uh, geometric assumptions and then subjective evaluation of the right ventricular function has been shown not to be accurate. And we always underestimate uh, by echo compared to MRI. So I think um, we should be using uh, MRI more and more often, especially in this group of patients that may benefit from an early uh, treatment before it's too late an RV has failed. An RV is a volume um, chamber, so it can adapt a lot of volume before it starts failing compared to the left side. So I think we're just missing all these patients who have subclinical TR, subclinical RV dysfunction, and then we are waiting too late to address the problem. So Bob Guyton and all of his wisdom but I've asked him uh, in operating on patients who have mitral valve disease. I said, Bob, what was your criteria for uh, putting in a tricuspid annular ring or doing a uh, stitch procedure? He says, well, if it's four millimeters or greater, I do it. I mean, for 40 millimeters or greater, I do it, four centimeters. So I noticed back in your, uh, one of your articles, talking about um, atrial fibrillation. It seems to me there is a disease process that little ladies get. They get atrial fibrillation, and they dilate both of their atria, and particularly they dilate their right atrium. They dilate their tricuspid annulus, 
they get to be 88 years old and they have severe TR and we can't do anything to them. So I have a little collection of those late little names. I said, well, one of these days I'm going to put this together because this is a definite entity. You mentioned it up there mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, somewhere. But anyway, they dilate their annulus up. They lose their coaptation point and develop micro, uh, a, um, tricuspid regurgitation. Sometimes they have micro regurgitation too. Um, when you're on the hearse service and you walk in the room, and you see regurgitant V waves in the neck, and the patient has edema, that is a very difficult situation to deal with. Because uh, they have TR, and if you diuresis them until the TR goes away, you know, their creatinine goes up like that. So it's just like a end stage kind of problem. You feel defeated when you walk in the room. And uh, the first thing you see is the giant regurgitant V waves. And if you take them to the cath lab, you see ventricularization of the atrial pressure tracing. So difficult thing to deal with. We always say in the echo lab that when you looked at the septal leaflet, that the septal leaflet does not have any papillary muscles. It just has cords that attach straight to the septum. And one reason that the tricuspid annulus dilates is because you can't very well dilate the septum right there. So you dilate everything else. It's kind of like a triangle, altogether different from the micro. So uh, thank you for pointing out all those great little points and teaching us all about the tricuspid valve. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.